One of the aspects that made Final Fantasy IX such a fantastic game was its diverse cast of characters. Only a few previous Final Fantasy games had included non-human protagonists, with prominent examples being Mog, Umaro, Red XIII and Ket Shi. But even though non-human characters did exist in those games, seldom were they given any time to shine. Instead, they would often be included as gimmicks, and poignant moments such as the focus on the backstory of Red XIII would end up being rare occurrences. Final Fantasy IX did not follow the same path. Through the inclusion of characters such as Zidane Tribal, Vivi, and of course Freya Crescent, the developers were able to create a rich, fantasy world that had so much depth and culture. This helped to elevate the notion of world building, and as a result, each of the characters, no matter how big or small, were given story arcs that felt meaningful. For Freya, even though she was neither the main protagonist, deuteragonist, or even tritagonist, this meant she was still given a considerable amount of time in the spotlight. It saw the development of something deep and meaningful, and it's why we're very excited to delve further into the story of Freya. So, strap yourselves in as we're about to explore the narrative of Final Fantasy IX, showcasing this heartbreaking and uplifting tale. And make sure you stay with us until the end as we analyse the very essence of Freya Crescent as a character. Freya was born during July of 1778 in the city-state of Bermicia. Known for its persistent rain, Bermicia was also known for its harsh climate, something that would further be compounded due to it being the only major nation to exist below the mist. In spite of these challenges, over hundreds of years, Bermesian citizens had learnt to adapt and even thrive. And with their nation developing, the main populace, fueled by the harmful effects of the mist, gained a lust for war and expansion. This would lead to numerous conflicts, with Alexandria often being the subject of their ire. But, after the invention of mist-powered airships, the nation of Lindblom, led by Sidfabal VIII, was able to broker peace between the two nations. This peace was brokered six years before Freya was born, and it meant she was raised during an era where the citizens of Bermesia were faced with numerous uncertainties. For years, war was the only thing many had known, with those who were mortified by this craving having left to form their own dwelling that would become known as Clara. For those that remained in Bermesia, conflict and martial prowess were fundamental tenets, but after the peace had been brokered, while some Bermesian citizens still yearned for the fight, others attempted to adapt to a new way of life that didn't revolve around everything being life and death. Still, there was always the threat that the peace would end. As such, Bermesia continued to train warriors to fill its ranks in case a new conflict should arise, and it meant that instead of those impressionable youths who grew up during this time of peace being imbued with a sense of intrigue and wonder, they still had yearnings for war. The only difference was that the previous yearnings, based around aggression, had been replaced by a desire to ensure that what was theirs could be defended in a suitable manner. Having grown up during this time, Freya too gained an interest in the martial arts. This interest then blossomed when Freya became a teenager, and by the age of 16, she had become a Dragon Knight. While training, Freya had got to know many individuals within the military, but there was one who left a much stronger impression than anyone else, a noble warrior named Fratley. As one of Bermesia's strongest warriors, Fratley had received numerous commendations from the crown, even being knighted for his service to the kingdom. That he took an interest in Freya was quite intriguing, not least because he was four years her senior. But even though strong feelings would develop between the pair, they would be superseded by Fratley's extreme dedication towards the defence of Bermesia. Whereas most within the Bermesian military had started to become accustomed to peace, Fratley was plagued with worry that their inaction and lack of willingness to evolve their equipment, training and strategies would be their downfall should a new conflict break out against Alexandria. He had also heard that warriors of great note, such as Beatrix, who hailed from the Kingdom of Alexandria, had started to emerge. And it was for this reason that Fratley left Bermesia, having been assigned a mission geared around learning everything he could about whatever threat, no matter how big or small, may be looming on the horizon. When Fratley informed Freya of this decision, she was devastated. And after her pleas for Fratley to stay were ignored, the only thing that gave her comfort was a commitment, 
that Fratley would return to Bermesia and to her once the reconnaissance mission was complete. Following Fratley's departure, Freya tried to distance herself from the pain, but no matter how much she attempted to focus her mind on both military training and the notion that one day Fratley would return, it became clear that a piece of her was missing, and until Fratley returned, Freya would not feel whole. With each day that passed, this desire to be reunited with Fratley festered, and one day, the desire became so great that Freya decided to leave everything behind she knew, departing Bermesia and venturing out into the world in search of her lost love. At first, Freya remained hopeful. Having left soon after Fratley himself had disembarked, a warm trail emerged, built from people who had either seen or heard from the legendary warrior. And as Freya followed this trail, it initially gave her hope that they would be reunited sooner rather than later. But after following the path for what became years, something that led to her climbing the highest mountains and venturing deep within what felt like bottomless caverns, the trail began to grow cold. It left Freya with nothing more than rumours to go on, and even though some were positive, regaling tales of Fratley's victories in combat, some were hard to swallow as they suggested that Fratley was no longer amongst the living. Knowing Fratley as well as she did, this was something that Freya refused to believe, but even though she never wanted to give up hope of finding Fratley, summoning the motivation to continue started to become harder and harder. Demoralised, Freya was left in limbo. Even though she yearned for home, returning to Bermesia alone would have been too hard to bear. There was also a realisation that continuing on the same path based on nothing more than rumours and hearsay would end up being a futile endeavour. After all, despite searching for years, Freya had learnt nothing concrete about what had actually happened to Fratley and it seemed unlikely that would change. The only thing that made sense in that moment was to stay put and try to focus on something else. Each year, Limblum hosted a remarkable competition called the Festival of the Hunt. Now hosted by the church, the Festival of the Hunt had been running for over five centuries, becoming a gathering ground for the world's greatest warriors. Some part of Freya must have hoped that Fratley would be in attendance given the prestige associated with the competition, but even if he failed to show, at least it would still represent a chance to ensure her skills had not deteriorated while being on the road for so long. While waiting for the competition to begin, Freya stumbled upon an old friend called Sedan. The pair had met years before, when Freya was much closer to the start of her journey, and although they hadn't been all that close at the time, their previous encounter had been impactful enough that Freya still remembered some of Sedan's more unsavoury qualities, and they considered each other to be more than just acquaintances. When it later became known that Sedan was also joining the Festival of the Hunt, Freya was intrigued. She had known Sedan to be a competent fighter, but that was many years ago, and she was curious to learn whether his skills had improved. She would not have too long to wait to receive an answer. With the festival drawing to a close, Freya came to the aid of two children who had been cornered by the Zagnol, a premium beast that had been bred with the specific objective of causing as much havoc as possible. Surmising the death of the children was perhaps not meant to be part of that objective, Freya teamed up with Zidane to defeat this foul beast. After their success, the hunt was deemed to have reached a suitable conclusion, and the appropriate rewards were handed out based on performance. But before Limblum could kick off the post-hunt festivities, grave news was delivered by a Burmesian soldier. He spoke of an unknown and deadly force that had invaded Burmesia, catching their military by complete surprise. The soldier then asked for aid from Limblum before providing a literal demonstration of the brutal nature of the assault they had managed to escape as they perished right there in the throne room. Having heard the news firsthand and witnessed the death of the Burmesian soldier, Freya was mortified. Everything she had just heard confirmed the fears that Fratley had voiced all those years ago, and it meant that even if his disappearance was still mysterious and painful to Freya, the reason for his quest had been justified in an instant. Rival factions had indeed been taking advantage of Burmesia's slumber, and when the opportune moment arrived, they had struck with ruthless precision. To make matters worse, due to nothing but sheer self-indulgence, Freya had not been there to help defend her homeland against this hostile force. Without hesitation, Freya therefore vowed to return home. Her country folk needed her, and they needed her now. 
The journey home will be fraught with danger, but each passing moment further strengthened Freya's resolve to make amends for her past actions. And although there was a sense of trepidation when stepping back inside Burmesia, once the level of destruction became apparent, Freya knew that she would do whatever it took to protect her king and her home, even if it came at the cost of her own life. That sentiment would then be tested, as after eavesdropping on the plans of Queen Bran, General Beatrix and Kuja, Freya was forced into action in order to save the life of a brave but foolhardy soldier. Through conversations with Fratley and her travels, Freya was very familiar with the prowess of Alexandria's prized general, but even though she knew that speaking up in defence of her fellow countrymen would be no different from signing her own death warrant, she could not just stand by and watch a fellow soldier, who clearly lacked her own martial ability, attempt to throw their own life away due to nothing more than an inability to control their emotions. At least, they would stand a fighting chance, or so she thought, as it would only be due to Beatrix having other priorities that Frey would escape with her life. Despite being an accomplished Dragon Knight and having the numerical advantage, Freya and her allies were defeated with relative ease. This would serve as a humbling experience, as this defeat was not just a personal one, but it signified the complete and utter capitulation of Burmesia as a nation. But even though that was the case, Freya could not afford to stay downbeat for long. After all, she was still alive, and while air could still be sucked into her lungs, she would fight back with all her might against the tyrannical actions of Queen Bran. Channeling this energy, after arriving in Clara, Freya would take part in an ancient ritual designed to strengthen the sandstorm that had kept the territory safe for almost a hundred years. They believed this would ward off any ambitious assault by Alexandria, but after the ritual failed and the sandstorm dispersed, it became abundantly clear that the Clarin Sanctuary was no longer secure and an invasion was imminent. Keen to explore their options and re-establish the defensive barrier, Freya sought out the source of the disruption, but in doing so, she fell for a terrible ruse that left the town itself exposed, and it would only be due to the actions of a skilled warrior that they would be saved from the menacing black mages that were indiscriminately massacring the settlement. After searching for years, Freya was stunned to see Fratley standing before her. That Fratley should appear in such a time of need was very poetic, and in response, Freya poured out her soul, revealing the extent of her journey she had taken to find her lost love. But the ecstasy she felt would soon turn to disbelief, as it became apparent that Fratley had lost his memory, and therefore had no recollection of who Freya was or why she seemed to know him. This was a crushing blow. Freya had spent years waiting for this moment, but fate had played a cruel hand, and all Freya could do was accept the reality of the situation, be happy that Fratley was still alive, and focus on the other task at hand, as they were still in mortal danger. With Fratley disappearing almost as soon as he appeared, Freya then prepared for round two with the ruthless General Beatrix, this time chiding her failure to finish them off before. But even though Freya and her compatriots fought with all their might, they were again found wanting, with Beatrix mocking them further by refusing to end the lives of those that she no doubt perceived as worthless. Following the encounter, everything moved fast. Freya was able to escape aboard one of the Alexandrian airships, but what she then witnessed would stay with her forever. Watching from afar, Freya saw Queen Bran unleash the colossal might of Odin on the Clarin settlement. The level of destruction was unprecedented, with a chance of survival next to none. And with Burmesia also desecrated, albeit to a lesser degree, it left Freya with the realisation that the once proud Burmesian people, who had created two prominent settlements on the Mist Continent, were now relegated to being a nomadic race. In just a matter of days, it meant everything Freya had known had come crashing down around her. The friends and family she had willingly abandoned in search of Fratley were now most likely dead. The home she grew up in was likely destroyed, and the man she loved, who she had dedicated years of her life to try and find, did not even know who she was. Any lesser individual would have suffered some kind of mental breakdown in the face of these truths, but after taking a moment's pause to grieve, something made all the more difficult by Sedan's inability to even process why someone might perhaps feel a bit emotional after what had just happened, Freya put on a brave face, regrouped, and focused on the task at hand. 
no longer having any specific objective of her own outside of seeking revenge against Alexandra and General Beatrix for their heinous acts, this saw Freya volunteer her spear to the greater fight. And in the immediate sense, this meant venturing to the heart of Alexandria itself. Freya could not quite have known what they would stumble upon, but after seeing what had happened to Garnett, she realised the true depths of Bran's depravity. And as the group ended up face to face with Beatrix once again, Freya resolved to continue fighting even though she knew the outcome would end up being the same. In the aftermath of this latest defeat, Beatrix remained dutiful and stoic, declaring that those who had been pitifully defeated should leave Alexandria and never return, something that was even directed towards her longtime colleague Steiner. But once Beatrix saw the state of Garnet, there was a stark realisation. Queen Bronn was no longer the woman she had once sworn fealty to. Her actions were wicked and cruel, akin to those of a mad woman. But instead of standing up and being strong, Beatrix had been weak hiding behind duty to justify actions that were unwarranted and cruel. Given what had just happened in Clara, this was especially pertinent, and Beatrix was instantly remorseful, asking for forgiveness for her actions. Having been powerless to stop Beatrix during both the assault on Bermicia and Clara, Freya rejected this notion. The sheer scale of Beatrix's devastation could not be forgotten with a simple platitude. But now was not the time for anger. The fight was not over, and having witnessed the strength of Beatrix firsthand multiple times, Freya realised she would be more valuable as an ally than as an enemy. It was for this reason that despite wanting so desperately to seek revenge for her fallen comrades, Freya asked for Beatrix's help, and then fought alongside her new ally so that Garnett may be able to escape without further incident. After fighting off a seemingly unending stream of Bandersnatch, Freya then decided to stay in Alexandria with Beatrix and Steiner. There was nothing that could be done to bring back the friends, family and countrymen that had been lost in this senseless war, and it was clear that everyone had been misled by Queen Bran. Yes, Freya was still angry, but the people of Alexandria did not deserve to be the focus of that anger. They would instead be focused towards someone who had been identified as the master puppeteer, Kuja. And after being reunited with Zidane, Freya made that quite clear. The emotions that had been simmering were starting to boil over. First, this led to an innocuous meeting with Amarant, almost escalating into something much more serious, and she then voiced her frustrations around the apathy she was witnessing in her once sprightly friend. And although part of this was down to general concern about the well-being of her friend, it was also rooted in the lack of work being undertaken towards finding Kuja. Ever since she was young, Freya had been given the gift of extreme focus and diligence. This allowed her to become a dragon knight at the age of just 16, and after giving her heart to Fratley, it saw her vow to find her lost love no matter how long it took. Now, that same focus and diligence will be geared towards finding Kuja and making sure he received the proper justice. But it also highlighted the perils of such dedication. When Kuja later chose to become so brazen that he mounted a direct assault on Alexandria Castle, Freya warned Zidane against fighting Kuja alone, as this wasn't just his war. She wanted to be there when the object of her attention fell, and didn't want Zidane stealing everything for himself. It was for this reason that once this obstacle was overcome, Freya continued to fight alongside Zidane and Garnett, and in doing so, she ended up forming a bond of mutual respect with Amaranth. This fight would lead her to the ends of the earth, but after the defeat of Garland, Kuja, and then Necron, Freya felt at peace. And even though she still wanted to follow Zidane as he went back into the fray to try and save Kuja, she respected that he wanted to go this particular journey alone. With the world saved from this particular evil, Freya was able to return to her original journey, finding Fratley. And with the pathway now much more clear, the search did not take anywhere near as long as it did before. After reconnecting, even though Fratley was still suffering from extreme memory loss, the pair were able to start fresh. And just as Fratley had fallen for Freya all those years ago, the same happened a second time around. And Bermesia would once again become the place they called home, as they vowed to help rebuild their homeland together. When looking back at Freya, it's difficult to see anything other than a strong, mature, and courageous character. That those traits carried through, despite Freya experiencing such a profound amount of loss, was also pretty incredible. 
But beyond that, what made Freya intriguing was that the loss she experienced didn't just relate to the loss of life. That in itself should have broken Freya, especially given the scale of what she had witnessed, how quickly it happened, and the fact she was so powerless to stop it. But looking beyond that, Freya helped to highlight another kind of loss. After being reunited with Fratley, we got to see Freya contend with the psychological trauma of losing an important relationship due to amnesia, something that would have been amplified by the amount of time she had lost searching for the person who no longer knew who she was. Even though that's a reality for many people every day, that aspect of loss is seldom represented within the various forms of media and entertainment that are being produced. And it was interesting that the writers chose to include such an arc, especially considering the game is over two decades old. How Freya handled those aspects was, for the most part, meant to be very idyllic. At each stage, she allowed herself to grieve in the moment, choosing not to wallow for any time longer than what was necessary. But there was one moment where an intentional crack was shown, and the placement of that scene felt quite purposeful. Much of Freya's story arc took place within the first part of Final Fantasy IX at a breakneck speed, but players were forced to have time away from Freya as the story focused elsewhere. During this time, Freya would have had more time to process her emotions, and when the player next saw Freya in a sequence where she squared off against Amaranth, they got to see a trait not seen before, as Freya was, for all intents and purposes, being irrational. After so much time had been spent on showing her level-headed and calm nature, this felt quite poignant, and it also made Freya much more relatable. And that's why, despite the story of Freya being quite condensed toward the start of the game, she would end up being so impactful, as even after taking a back seat, the small pockets of dialogue she was given would still be meaningful in the grand scheme of things. But yeah, with that small analysis out of the way, that marks the end of this Final Fantasy IX Origins video. Thank you all so much for watching. It's been some time since our last Origins video, with it being even longer since we tackled a story that did not relate to Final Fantasy VII, so apologies for that, but we hope it was worth the wait. And if you did enjoy the video, please be sure to hit that like button, and share it around to everyone you know who loves Final Fantasy IX. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the channel, and let us know in the comments below what Freya means to you as a character. Alright everyone, with that, this is Daryl signing out. I'd like to extend a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube members and supporters, especially Benjamin Snow, Chris M. Walker, The Livestream, Elsa Claire Farron, Galsin D. Kujata, Gregory, Justin Dent, Lord of Mourning, and Zukan TDK, who are super special Onion Eye supporters. And of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.